from inside the warehouse at Oriole Park at Camden Yards, it is the Masson All Access Podcast and under caffeinated Paul Mancano, joined by an always under caffeinated Brendan Mortensen. You don't drink coffee, don't know why you do it, don't know how you do it, more importantly. Yeah. But I am now ramping myself back up after a busy trade deadline, Brendan. Wow. I, I don't need caffeine to get amped up for this podcast, Paul. I am amped up by the magic of Orioles baseball. That's I all I need in the morning. My dulcet tones kind of just wake you up in the morning, you know? No. Nope. You hear my voice and you nope. think the, the excitement of Certainly not. joining a podcast with nope. Paul Mancano just is enough to get you out not of bad. bed. It's enough to, to wake people up and, and join our chat and watch live on Facebook and on YouTube. I suppose so. I suppose so. Again, this is a bit... I, I like want to make it clear that I'm really not this cocky in real life. Uh, Brendan, we have so much to talk about on this podcast. We're going to talk about all the moves that the Orioles made during the trade deadline. Three trades as they send out Trey Mancini and Jorge Lopez in two separate deals. They also acquire Brett Phillips in a deal that happened shortly before the deadline. We're going to get to all that in just a moment. But first and foremost, Brendan, Orioles won again last night. They are now have won the first two games of this series against the Texas Rangers have dominated both of those games, and they've also surpassed their win total for 2021. They have 53 wins so far in 2022, off to an excellent start. And Brandon Hyde said last night that was more a reflection of just how much they struggled in 2021, (laughs) but it also, to me, speaks volumes about how far they've come over the past 365 days. Yeah, if you haven't listened to Brandon Hyde's presser from yesterday, it's it's pretty funny. It's funny. His yeah. post-game press conference from last night essentially saying, like you said, that that was much more of a reflection of just how bad the team was last year, and he just didn't really want to talk about how bad the team was last year. But you're right, Paul. A really unbelievable improvement from one season to the next, and I know that that mood has been dampered a little bit, by the trade deadline and the moves that the Orioles made, but it should not downplay how exciting this season has been. The play that we have seen from some of the younger players who were untouchable at the trade deadline, which is, I I think, a point that we probably haven't talked about a lot, which is that Austin Hayes, Cedric Mullins, players like that were seemingly untouchable at the trade deadline, it seemed like. We weren't really hearing any rumors about those kinds of players. And I think if this was a year or two ago, we would probably be questioning at this deadline whether Austin Hayes or Cedric Mullins would be on the move. We did a podcast a couple days ago, live reaction to the Trey Mancini trade. We're going to talk a little bit more about the Trey Mancini trade because I think the last 48 hours have given us a little bit more clarity and have given us some time to reflect on the move itself, but I do want to talk first and foremost about the move that we have not had a chance to talk about yet on the podcast, and that's the trade of Jorge Lopez to the Minnesota Twins, which occurred yesterday morning. This one is slightly more surprising than the Mancini trade because of the years of control that the Orioles are surrendering here. Two and a half years of control for Jorge Lopez, a 29-year-old all-star closer, who was in the midst of a career year, like many members of this Orioles bullpen. And the Orioles clearly believe, in my mind, they would not have done this move if they did not believe that this is the best that Jorge Lopez will ever look and that Jorge Lopez's value will never be higher than it is right now. Yeah, if you're following along on Facebook or YouTube, you can see the trade details that we have up as the Orioles receive reliever Yenier Cano. Cade Povich is the highlight of this return for the Orioles. Slots in as their number 26 overall prospect in their top 30, according to MLB Pipeline. And then a couple of flyers in Juan Nunez and Juan Rojas. It's a hockey team. That's right, Mm -hmm. yes, but uh, they receive two pitchers in Juan Nunez and and Juan Rojas. These guys play baseball. And then give up Jorge Lopez and cash considerations as as Paul is providing some very helpful commentary. (laughs) When we were talking about a potential Jorge Lopez trade, I essentially said that I think the Orioles would hang on to him unless a trade offer blew them away. I'm not necessarily blown away by this return for Jorge Lopez. I think Cade Povich is a very good prospect. I think when we get some updated rankings, it'll be a combination of some draft picks coming in to maybe bump him down a little bit, but I also think that Povich has a chance to be a fast riser 
throughout the minor leagues right now. He is still at high A, but has a fantastic pitch mix. He is missing a lot of bats in the minor leagues right now. And Steve Molesky reported that when he was talking to a scout, that scout said that a lot of teams were checking in on Cade Povich and his availability in trade talks. So Povich clearly a popular name around the league, and I, he is clearly the highlight of this trade. I also think Yannier Cano could be an X factor. He has not looked great so far in his brief sample in the major leagues, but again, missing a lot of bats, had a 45% chase rate in his very brief stint in the majors so far. Needs to get the command issues under control, but it seems like he will probably start in AAA Norfolk. Hopefully the Orioles can get some of those command issues under control, no pun intended, and we can see Cano as a solid reliever at the major league level. I think when you look at the return that the Orioles got for Trey Mancini and those two prospects who were more highly regarded, who immediately fit into the Orioles' top 30, top 15 of their MLB pipeline prospect rankings, I do think those guys were perhaps had the arrow pointing slightly down in the short term. One of them was headed towards Tommy John's surgery, and the other one was coming off a bad year, those two prospects being Seth Johnson and Chase McDermott. This, I think, is an instance where Cade Povich's arrow is pointing up, and maybe that 22 ranking in the twin system doesn't tell the full story, and the Orioles believe he could go higher than that. And the Orioles getting back those four pitchers is another reminder also, uh, I said on Mass and All Access yesterday, of the Dylan Bundy trade where they sent him to the Angels in a deal where they netted four pitching prospects and they got a guy by the name of Kyle Bradish whose arrow was pointing up. So he was not immediately one of the Orioles' top pitching prospects, but turned into that because they saw something in him and they developed him and his arrow was slightly pointing up when they traded for him. So I think Cade Povich is different in that perhaps these, uh, these rankings don't fully yet reflect the kind of potential that we've seen from him in his small pro career. On the surface level right now, I am surprised at the return that they got for Jorge Lopez, meaning that I thought the Orioles probably could have gotten more for an all-star closer with a 168 ERA. But there are also a lot of arguments to say that Jorge Lopez probably shouldn't have commanded a ton at this deadline, given the fact that he has a career ERA of six. Yeah, He has half a season of a track record at this point. And obviously, the Orioles have seen Jorge Lopez become a reliable closer here. I mean, he didn't give up an earned run for the entire month of July. He has had a fantastic season so far. The stuff clearly plays. He has a 99-mile-an-hour sinker. He has some very good secondary pitches. Jorge Lopez, it seems like so far has proven that he can be a solid reliever. But teams around the league probably don't know whether or not this success is sustainable. Yeah. So maybe this is just the best return that you could get for Lopez. And when you're talking about a potential return, Mancini is essentially a rental. Yeah. And I think you and I were both surprised at the return that they got for trade Mancini, considering that you were essentially getting him for nine weeks. Jorge Lopez still has multiple years of team control. He's not going to be a free agent until 2025, which only adds to his value at the deadline. But you're right, Paul. I think the true evaluation of this trade, not the true evaluation, but we'll get a better idea of this trade at the end of the year. Yeah. Because we'll see what Cade Povich is able to do at high A. I would anticipate that we see Povich at double A buoy relatively soon, given the fact that he's 23 years old. He was an established college pitcher. He has looked great at high A so far. And then Yenier Cano as well. If Yenier Cano is able to spend a few weeks at AAA Norfolk and then come up to the majors and hopefully have those command issues under control, but keep that same swing and miss that he has already flashed at the major league level, I think Cano could really make or break this deal. Because if he turns into a solid reliever, then all of a sudden you got a prospect with back end of the rotation potential, even mid rotation potential in Cade Povich, and then a solid reliever in Cano. We should also make clear, though, that Cano has not looked good in his small sample size in the big leagues. He has so, not. So I'm not sure that the odds of that are particularly high, and he's only a year younger than Jorge Lopez. But a 190 ERA with 9.5 strikeouts per 9 at AAA. That's true. 
However, we have seen a lot of pitchers have great success as relievers. I The example I always think of is a Dustin Knight, who was excellent in AAA in the his later 20s and never was able to transfer that success. The question is, is he a 4A player, so to speak, or is he a big league reliever? It's certainly possible, and the 922 ERA at the big league level so far is certainly nothing to write home about. I don't think the stuff is as overwhelming as the comparison I'm about to make, but Felix Bautista had terrible command issues last year in the minor leagues, was able to correct them in the Orioles system, and yeah. now we're seeing seeing what Felix Bautista can do. Cano doesn't have the same overwhelming stuff, but the chase rate is certainly encouraging. The swinging strike rate is certainly encouraging. Maybe the Orioles just believe that he can be a solid piece, and I don't think he would be in this trade if they didn't believe that. I think going back to one thing you said about how a reliever with a one six eight ERA at the trade deadline who is a legitimate closer for a team that is above 500 should probably net you a little bit more than this. But you also mentioned the track record, and you're looking at other relievers being dealt around baseball right now. The Josh Hader comparison is an easy one to make because he did not have as good numbers as Jorge Lopez did. His ERA was over four. He wasn't pitching as many innings. Yes, he had more saves, so he was being used always in the ninth inning for a Brewers team that is in first place in their division. But his overall statistics were not as good as Jorge Lopez. The major difference is Josh Hader has been one of the better closers in baseball for several years now. And Jorge Lopez is brand new to this role. And I think the Orioles don't surrender this kind of controllable reliever if they don't think that this is the best that he's going to be. We saw last year the Orioles hold on to Tanner Scott and Paul Fry at the trade deadline when both those guys had ERAs around three, and we thought that they might cash in on them both. But I think they had higher expectations for both of those guys, and unfortunately, both of those guys had rough second halves of the season, and they ended up trading them at the beginning of this season with Paul Fry being DFA'd before he was traded. So I think the Orioles would not make this move if they didn't think that Jorge Lopez had a first half of the season that we will never see again. I think they may not expect him to be the pitcher with a 6 ERA and him to fall apart in the second half, but I do think they think that 168 ERA is somewhat of an anomaly and it's going he's going to come back down to earth a little bit. So this is the highest his value will be, will sell high and we'll hope to get a good return for somebody who frankly does not have a long track record of being a very good closer. It's possible that the 168 ERA is an anomaly, Paul, but there's also just a chance that this is who Jorge Lopez is. There, that there is. the stuff is very good, that he is a great closer, and you just traded him away for a prospect with middle of the rotation potential and a reliever that has not been very good in the major league level. And there, there's a chance that this is just Jorge Lopez is just the guy. And two there's a chance. young lottery tickets. Right. There is a chance, and every trade comes with risk, and there's a small voice in the back of my head that says, what if the Orioles in 2023 are a team that is hoping to legitimately compete for a wild card spot, and they're maybe at next year's trade deadline, 10 or 15 games above 500, if everything goes to plan and they're actually good next year, and they don't have a reliable closer. And they're the team that's looking to buy at the deadline because they're losing too many games in the eighth and ninth inning because they don't have enough pitching, because Jorge Lopez was traded. You can always use those more guys. And so that's the risk that the Orioles are incurring here. But they're also betting on themselves. They're betting on the fact that they can turn Felix Bautista into a legitimate closer. And if it's not Felix Bautista, it's going to be somebody else in their system. It could be CNL Perez. It could be somebody that they claim off waivers, like we've said. It could be somebody that they traded for in this trade or in the previous trades. So... There are multiple paths to success here, but this trade has a little bit more risk than the Trey Mancini trade. It does. And maybe I suggested it on the last podcast kind of jokingly, but maybe the Orioles just think that they can do this again. I mean, Jorge Lopez was a waiver claim. He was DFA'd by the Kansas City Royals in 2020, and the Orioles turned him into a piece at the deadline who is an all-star starter with a 168 ERA and 19 saves and they just flipped him for a prospect that could be a top 20 prospect in the system by the end of the year, a few lottery tickets, and maybe a reliever that turns into something at the big league level. Maybe they just think they can keep doing it with waiver claims, with guys that they 
kind of get off the scrap heap at this point. We're seeing it again this season with Austin Voth, with CNL Perez. Brian Baker has been solid as well. The Orioles just, has of the last few seasons, are starting to have a track record of finding guys from anywhere and turning them into good pitchers. And the question then becomes, too, I think, then why didn't they trade some of these other guys if they believe that they can do it again? But I think Lopez was slightly closer to free agency than some of these other guys. Perez yes. has a little bit more team control than Jorge Lopez does because Lopez, remember, was a struggling starter for the first several years of his career, whereas Perez is really only one year of a major league experience before this year with the Cincinnati Reds. Felix Bautista made his big league debut this year. Uh, Brian Baker probably would not have gotten you anything at the deadline. Dylan Tate was the only other name that we discussed as maybe somebody that the Orioles could sell high on. But also, Dylan Tate's a ground ball pitcher. He's not a strikeout pitcher. There probably was not a huge market for a guy like that that is also not a closer. Dylan Tate is really not used in nearly as many high leverage situations as Jorge Lopez. So the the, the likely return for somebody like Dylan Tate probably just wouldn't match what he gives you with him being on the current roster. And Dylan Tate also has one more year of team control. Precisely. He's not a free agent yeah. until 2026. Right. Also, some news coming across uh, our Twitter feeds as well. That's Yusniel Diaz has been optioned down to AAA Norfolk. So his one at-bat yesterday, struck out on four pitches, is going to be his one major league at-bat for at least a few days. Hopefully he gets a call back up at some point because Brett Phillips, who the Orioles traded for, has been added to their 26-man roster, and he's joining the team. We'll get to that in a little bit, but I do want to go back to the Trey Mancini trade because I had some more thoughts. I was thinking about it more. You get our immediate reaction right after the trade happens, and a lot of thoughts were given, and I have some altered takes, I guess you could say, Brendan, because Ooh. not altered takes. I'm not going to change anything I said, but I thought about it a little bit more, and I listened to what Mike Elias said, after the Trey Mancini deal, he acknowledged that it was an emotional one for the Orioles and for him in particular because of what Trey has given this city and what Trey has given this franchise over the last several years. But he reiterated the fact that the goal of this rebuild from the very beginning is not to make the playoffs as a wild card team once every couple years. Maybe you sneak into the playoffs, you're a quick out for the Yankees, for the Rays, for the Astros, and you are kind of mired in mediocrity. The goal of this rebuild is to build a consistent contender for World Series championships. Right. And the Orioles made this move with Trey Mancini in the hope that the pieces that they got back and the flexibility that it affords them opens up their championship window for a longer amount of time. And from a baseball perspective, the more I look at this trade, the more impressive the haul becomes for Trey Mancini. I, I completely understand every emotional side of this deal. I mean, Paul, you and I were talking about Trey Mancini on the initial reaction podcast that we did, and it, like, it was hard to talk about yeah. because it was even emotional for us from this media perspective of not having Trey Mancini on this team anymore. But in three years, if Seth Johnson turns into a number three starter at the big league level, this is going to look like a fantastic trade. I think that's lofty. It's but lofty, but Seth Johnson has a ton of potential. He is now the Orioles' number eight prospect in their top 30. That's the third best pitching prospect. It is, but he's right around the range that Mike Bauman is in, who currently has a 4-2-6 ERA with AAA Norfolk and frankly has not looked excellent at the big league level. A little bit ahead of where Mike Bauman is, but yes. I, I would put him closer to more of a Kyle Bradish at the beginning of the year type of category, where Bradish was, yes, kind of next to Mike Bauman and sort of in that Zach Lowther category, but Bradish seemed to kind of be in his own category of clearly better with a little bit more potential than a guy like Mike, Mike Bauman. That's where I'd put Seth Johnson. Yeah, I think it's tough to say right now, especially because of the injury. We're, we have yet to see how he's going to recover from Tommy John. Right. So that is going to definitely change things, the calculus there. And also, like we said on our last podcast, Seth Johnson, Chase McDermott, these guys will likely be pushed down 
the top 30 prospect list as a Jackson Holiday and Dylan Beavers get added to this system and get added to this ranking. So Seth Johnson is probably going to be, what, 9-10 when Dylan Beavers and Jackson Holiday are added. That's still incredibly high. And like I said, the arrow might be pointing slightly down in the short term, but you are getting a guy with incredible potential. And the Orioles could have come away with a couple quality pitchers in exchange for what is ultimately a two-month rental. And I think probably a lot of Orioles fans would agree that from a baseball perspective, this move makes a ton of sense. Because even if you're looking at the Orioles lineup, yes, it's exciting to look at the future with guys like Seth Johnson and Chase McDermott and the potential pitchers that they could turn into. Even if you're looking at the major league level for just this season, we're going to see some exciting players in that DH role or maybe getting starts in right field if Anthony Santander is DHing. Maybe we'll get to see Kyle Stowers relatively soon. Anthony Santander has been incredibly productive this year. We'll see Adley Rutschman in the DH role more often, more than likely. He's DHing this afternoon. Taron Vavra was the DH last night and gets on base four times. So I don't think the production out of that DH spot is going to drop off drastically from Trey Mancini. Yeah. Mancini is still a fantastic player, fantastic hitter, not taking anything away from Mancini, but the DH spot on a rebuilding team is just not the spot that you look at and say, okay, that's a spot we need to fill. The DH spot is something where the Orioles are probably going to benefit from getting some younger guys at bats in that role. I think Jeff Passan, you sent me a clip of Passan talking yesterday, the ESPN reporter on baseball tonight about the Orioles and defending their decision to trade Trey Mancini in part and saying, let's not confuse a team that is a couple games above 500 like the Orioles, like with teams like the Braves of last year who were right around 500 and ended up going on to win the World Series or the Nationals of 2019 who were right around 500 at the trade deadline and bought and ended up winning the World Series. The Orioles are building for next year and the year beyond. And yes, they are a couple games above 500. But if the Orioles suddenly go on a little bit of a losing streak and they find themselves out of a, a wild card contention, it won't be because they traded Trey Mancini. No. It'll be because this regression was coming. It's because they are not built to win this year and they have been overperforming. And I hope that they win. I hope they continue to win. I hope they're in the wild card race until the very end of the season. But I wouldn't be surprised if they drop off a little bit and regress a little bit towards the mean. And if they do, it's because they've been incredibly overperforming through the first four months of the season, not because they traded Trey Mancini. This has been a top five bullpen in all of baseball. And I understand that you traded Jorge Lopez, who was your closer and kind of your rock at the back end of the bullpen. But talent-wise this bullpen was not close to being a top five bullpen in baseball coming into the year. Yeah. They're overperforming. I mean, CNL Perez and Felix Bautista have ERAs under two. Yeah. That's maybe that's who they are. Maybe they have just flashed this potential. And this is what we should expect from CNL Perez and Felix Bautista more than likely not. There are plenty of hitters in this lineup that have been kind of overperforming a little bit as well. And again, Maybe that's just who they are, and maybe this is the way that the Orioles are trending. But as you said, Paul, it's a lot of overperforming, and the goal of this rebuild is not to make the wild card. As fun as that would be, as rewarding as it would be to finally see an Orioles team that makes the playoffs after the last few years of rebuilding, that's not the goal. The goal isn't to sneak into the playoffs and get eliminated early. The goal is to go deep into the playoffs. You know what the Orioles don't want to be? is the Pittsburgh Pirates of 2013, 14, and 15. When they made three playoff appearances, they were not all in, but they were buying routinely in the offseason and at the trade deadline because they thought they had a better contender than they were. They had an MVP in Andrew McCutcheon. They had an MVP in Andrew McCutcheon. They came from a small market, and they lost in the DS, then lost in the wild card, and lost in the wild card. And they haven't sniffed the playoffs since then. They're currently in the midst of a massive rebuild. The Orioles don't want to be that. They don't want to be a team that sneaks into the playoffs for a three- or four-year window, and then guess what? They have to tear it all back down again. They need to build a consistent winner. Again, to bring up the Josh Hader trade, what did Milwaukee do with their 
all-star closer on a team that is currently in first place in their division, they had to trade him because they understood that their window can't just be as wide as it possibly can for three or four or two years. It has to be open for as long as possible. So when you're a small market team, you have to win around the edges like this. And so trading Trey Mancini, trading Jorge Lopez, the hope is that they're cracking it open for longer. They're extending their window to make sure that they have as many bites of the apple, as many chances to win a World Series as possible. Not just, let's hope that we can sneak into the playoffs for a couple years in a row. Let's trade away all these prospects. Let's buy at the deadline. And then, well, we're going to have a bad farm system in a couple years, and we're going to have to tear it all back down again. And an important point that we haven't talked about a ton, but now that the trade deadline is passed, I think it's worthy of bringing up here. As we get into the offseason and trade deadlines of the future, the Orioles are not going to be selling a ton, more than likely. I think the goal over the next few years, we've mentioned the goal for next year. The goal for next year should be making the playoffs. Yeah. Given how this team has performed, given some of the prospects that will hopefully be up at the major league level next year, like Grayson Rodriguez, like Gunnar Henderson, D.L. Hall, some of those names, the goal for next season is should be to make the playoffs. So when you look at this offseason and maybe even next trade deadline, it really helps in trade negotiations to have the number one farm system in all of baseball. Yeah, We're talking about Seth Johnson as maybe a potential mid-rotation piece. Seth Johnson could be traded next year if the Orioles are at the deadline, see an established pitcher on the market, want to go get a veteran, and then you start using the number one farm system in all of baseball, not just as a place to develop your own players for the major league level, but to trade to other teams to get established veterans to start pushing towards more winning baseball. It's the exact same conversation we had about the 2022 draft class where we said the Orioles are getting a bunch of guys that will not be contributors at the major league level for several years and, frankly, could be trade chips right. in a year or two, depending on how quickly this thing turns around. And that's kind of what we're seeing as well. The Orioles just are trying to extend that window of legitimate contention for as long as possible. Brendan, I do want to get to what the Orioles do now without Trey Mancini. And the addition of Brett Phillips changes the cal- calculation slightly. One that I was not expecting. That was weird. You mentioned the DH role now opening up for some of the young players on the Orioles, like an Adley Rutschman, like a Kyle Stowers, potentially, or a Terran Vavra. But the Orioles went out and got a veteran center fielder who, yes, is a great clubhouse guy in Brett Phillips, but also is probably not, in all likelihood, part of your long-term future. And they didn't just pick him up off a waiver claim. They traded cash for him right before the deadline. When this deal went down, my first reaction was, surely there's an Anthony Santander trade on the horizon because they're adding an outfielder. In theory, an outfielder should be headed out. But the Orioles must think that Brett Phillips' full potential is not being utilized in Tampa Bay right now and that he brings something to this clubhouse that perhaps they lost in Mancini and Lopez. My initial reaction was that this is a clubhouse move which is weird because you don't really make a trade for a guy that's just going to be good in the clubhouse. That can't be the entire reason. I mean, Brett Phillips is one of the best personalities in all of baseball. He's super fun. Super fun doesn't win baseball games. Well, it it does help morale. It does. I will say that the Orioles do prioritize that. When it comes to free agency, yes. clearly Rugnet Odor, they liked what they had, they liked what they heard about him in the clubhouse. Jordan Lyles, the same way, and both of those guys have been great clubhouse presence. Sure, Ho- uh, Jose Iglesias a couple years ago as well. And there is something to be said for being a great clubhouse presence, but that pairs with what happens on the field. And when you look at Brett Phillips, it's not like he's not giving you any value. He is one of the best defensive outfielders in all of baseball. He is a great defensive center fielder, but he's not really hitting the ball well right now. Maybe the Orioles just believe, like you said, that there is some untapped potential there. But when you look at Brett Phillips, especially in the Orioles outfield conversation, I kind of struggle to find what he gives you that Ryan McKenna doesn't. He feels redundant. Right. 
because Ryan McKenna is somebody that we've talked about all year as a fantastic defensive replacement who is a threat on the base paths with his speed, can play any outfield position, and Ryan McKenna, by all accounts, too, is a really fun guy in the clubhouse. That's something we've heard about Ryan McKenna. So it feels eerily similar to just having Ryan McKenna on this team, so why do you have both? And Ryan McKenna's bat is better right now, and he's younger with more potential. Yeah, our comments are discussing this as well, and Brady on Facebook is mentioning the fact that you could use Brett Phillips in a platoon-like situation. Could use him as a reliever, Brett Phillips, known great pitcher. (laughs) This is true. Yeah, Uh, He's very clutch as well. We saw him in the the World Series a couple years ago come up in, in some big spots as well could use him against right-handed pitching, use him in right field as a platoon-like situation, but over the course of his career, yes, he hits lefties very poorly, so you wouldn't use him against lefties. No. He doesn't hit righties a whole lot better. He's it's, not hitting anybody very well this season. Over the course of his career, he's got a 703 OPS against righties. So you're not going to use him at all against lefties. You know no. that. And against righties, I don't think he gives you much that somebody else wouldn't. And especially with Ryan McKenna already on the team, with Kyle Stowers yet to come back up after he had that one series in Toronto, mashing the ball at AAA. Yeah, can we talk about that for a second, Paul? What is the plan Use for Kyle Diaz Stowers? Also, uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't quite know at this point, point. Um, and I know that the Orioles know. I'm sure that they have a plan for him long term. The fact that, the fact that. Diaz got the call up before Stowers. To me, is a Michael Elias move where somebody else who is a little bit older and has a little bit more of a track record is first in line. I think of the Stevie Wilkerson getting called up before Jemai Jones move last year. Somebody who is ahead in line and making sure that that guy gets up. But then the fact that you send Yusnio Diaz right back down after you acquire Brett Phillips is confusing to me. And yeah. I don't know, then, was Yusniel Diaz simply a short-term solution while they waited to acquire another outfielder or while they waited to see as the dust settled in the trade deadline? My question is, if another spot in the outfield opens up via trade, or not via trade, because it can't happen now, but via injury or something else, is Yusniel Diaz going to get the call up ahead of Kyle Stowers? What is, how is this outfield going to work itself out? It's interesting because... Like you said, I I think once Kyle Stowers is here, Kyle Stowers is probably here for good. Kyle Stowers, hopefully, upon promotion, will get a close-to-everyday role. I think you would want him starting pretty consistently, whether it's in right field, whether it's as a designated hitter. I can't imagine that Stowers will come up and just be a backup outfielder consistently. I don't think they would put him in a Ryan McKenna role or a Tyler Nevin role of just not getting a lot of playing time. So maybe Yusniel Diaz is just a case of, okay, call him up now, see what you have in Yusniel Diaz, give him occasional ABs, and if it's if it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be. Right. And then Similar Kyle Stowers Bannon. will get a much longer shot than Yusniel Diaz will. I'm just surprised that we haven't seen him yet. I mean, I thought when Trey Mancini got traded – almost the corresponding move would be to call up Kyle Stowers from AAA Norfolk because he's mashing down there. Right, and that would make more sense if they didn't add Brett Phillips. Right. If if, if they said, all right, we're really going to give Yusniel Diaz a shot, similar to Ryland Bannon. We're going to, if it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be. Yes, his stats in AAA are not great. Three homers, 234 batting average. But give him every day at bats or give him at least a shot to establish himself at the big league level as a fourth outfielder and hope that it works out. But then the addition of Brett Phillips and you send using Diaz back down, that just, it seems like it's setting everybody back in line a little bit and it's having the queue back up a little bit longer than it was already. Even I'm, I'm just a little, look, I trust Mike Elias. Mike Elias has not given us, any reason not to trust him so far, especially given how the current Major League roster is playing. But Kyle Stowers with an 890 OPS with 17 homers at AAA Norfolk after winning Co-Minor League Player of the Year a season ago just 
seems to indicate that he would be ready to go. He's knocking on the door. He is. And he's been knocking on the door for a long time now. So we'll see what happens there. Let's talk about some guys that were not traded as well. We mentioned the relievers that were not dealt. Anthony Santander are not traded. Now, we thought that the Orioles, in order to give Kyle Stowers and eventually Colton Kowser a shot at the outfield long-term, might try to clear up the log jam earlier than necessary and deal 27-year-old switch hitting, power hitting Anthony Santander. But they didn't have to trade him. No. Because he still has a year and a half of team control. Because he's still hitting very well in the middle of this lineup and you just lost your first baseman who was producing pretty well in the middle of that lineup as well. They didn't have to deal Anthony Santander. And clearly they felt no pressure to do so because they would not have held on to him if they didn't. I think the conversations that we usually have around Anthony Santander are interesting considering he's not that much older than a Cedric Mullins or Austin Hayes. Right. We view him usually in a very different light. Even though Anthony Santander has been in the middle of this lineup consistently where Cedric Mullins and Austin Hayes don't really provide the same power that Anthony Santander does. He's a switch hitter who plays solid defense, is probably going to have around a 750, 775 OPS and maybe hit 25 home runs. It's a quality corner outfielder. Yeah. And the Orioles did not need to trade him. Like you said, he's only 27 years old. He has a year and a half of team control left. And it would kind of... I don't think it's fair to assume that once Kyle Stowers is promoted he's going to provide the same value that no. Anthony Santander does immediately. Anthony Santander is a solid major league player, and we can't assume that Kyle Stowers is just going to be that good right off the jump. Yeah, Kyle Stowers, again, is not a top 100 prospect. He's not a Gunnar Henderson or even a Jordan Westberg. He's not viewed as highly as some of the other top prospects in their system. According to MLB Pipeline, he's the seventh best prospect in their system, so you don't clear the deck for that kind of guy. The only confusion for me is the Orioles didn't have to trade Jorge Lopez either. They also right. surrendered team control when it came to their all-star closer. And right now it feels like the offers probably just were not there for Santander to move him. Because I do think if they got what they considered fair value for Anthony Santander, I don't think that Mike Elias has ever committed himself fully to Santander being on this team long term. Not that he has to with anybody on this team. You know, he hasn't come out and said that about Austin Hayes. He's been a little bit more bullish on Cedric Mullins' long-term future, called him a face-of-the-franchise type player at this point last year. But he's never really committed himself to Santander. So I do think if the offer were there, they would have traded Santander. It just didn't materialize. But it's tough to say, yes, the Orioles didn't have to trade Anthony Santander, so they kept him. But then also say, well, the Orioles didn't have to trade Jorge Lopez, but they traded him. But I will say a reliever is a lot more volatile than a corner outfielder. True. You pretty much know what you have in Anthony Santander. This is what he has shown you despite injuries over the last few seasons. Jorge Lopez has shown you a few months of success. Right. And that's not a knock on Jorge Lopez. He has been fantastic this year, and we wish him nothing but success in Minnesota but he has a much smaller track record than Anthony Santander was. This is a former most valuable Oriole a few seasons ago. You know what you have in this guy. And maybe the Orioles are just content with knowing the value that Anthony Santander provides you right now. And if there is not a great offer at the deadline to drag him away from Baltimore, he's still a solid player in the middle of your lineup for a team that's playing competitive baseball. And you don't need to move that guy. I'm glad that you mentioned the injuries as well because I do think the injuries are a factor and the fact that Anthony Santander was in the midst of his first really fully healthy season of his career played 110 games last year that was his previous career high he's at 96 so far so he's played in just about every Orioles game that they've played so far and it is a concern that is he going to be able to stay healthy enough for if if your plan is to trade him long term he has to stay healthy enough for you to do that because if he gets hurt, his trade value goes right down. And if the Orioles were saying to themselves, well, we can just trade him in the offseason, we can just trade him at next trade deadline if we want to open up a spot for Kyle Stowers or Colton Kowser, well, 
if he gets hurt in the final two months of the season, if he gets hurt right before next trade deadline, then the Orioles' potential return for an Anthony Santander trade just went down a whole lot. So it is a concern. But I don't think at this deadline that return for Anthony Santander would have been anything immense. I think you probably just would have gotten a prospect that you hope in a few years could turn into the kind of player that Anthony Santander is right now. Yeah, and I will say we have had this conversation just so many times. Yes. I think we're just destined to do this dance forever with Anthony Santander because, Brendan... He won't even be on the team. We'll be asking if Anthony Santander is getting traded. I am just flashing forward to our podcasts in December and January and we're talking about Anthony Santander trade packages to the White Sox. I already know what it's going to be. It's going to be an off-season <laughs> podcast where we talk about whether or not the Orioles should give Kyle Stowers an everyday role in right field and whether or not they should trade Anthony Santander to make that happen. Tune into that podcast when it happens in, like, February. And what's fair value for Anthony Santander? Yep. That's It's going to be the same exact podcast. We're just going to do we it. Have, I, I think that's the first time we've teased a podcast that is coming Five months Stay in advance. Stay tuned. Stay yeah. tuned for that. Uh, mark your calendars. Uh, one other guy that was not traded, Brendan, that I think is worthy of discussion is Jordan Lyles because nom, he, nom, 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 nom. He's eating those innings. That's the value that he would have given a playoff contender is innings eater. And that I do think that that does have value on playoff contenders because teams are always looking for guys to um, fill in when they have injuries in their rotation, look around some of the best contenders in baseball right now. A lot of them have injuries to their rotation. And I think Jordan Lyles, yeah, he's not going to be one of your playoff four, so to speak. He's not going to get a playoff start, but he could have eaten innings for a playoff team, similar to how Andrew Kashner did back in 2019, or at least was hoping to, uh, for the Boston I mean, Red Sox when the Orioles dealt him there, and then he ended up not having a great year with the Boston Red Sox, but that was the thinking of the Red Sox trading for him. That's the thinking of the Braves when they traded for Tommy Malone, was that, boy, we have a whole lot of injuries in our rotation. This guy's not going to be a playoff starter, but we need him to eat innings in the short term. I think he could have given that to a team, but clearly teams did not value him enough to give him to give Mike Elias a good package for him. Again, I think this is just another player who falls into the category of being more valuable on the Orioles than the value that he would have commanded at the deadline. Because Jordan Lyles, you can look at the numbers. You can't really quantify how important he has probably been for this bullpen and for Brandon Hyde to just not have to throw a bunch of bullpen arms whenever Jordan Lyles pitches. Yeah. Because you know that he is going to give you 175,000 pitches whenever he goes out every five days, and that saves your bullpen. And I don't think there's really, like I said, any quantifying how important it has been for the bullpen to essentially get rest days whenever Jordan Lyles is pitching because you probably only need two, maybe three bullpen arms after Jordan Lyles is out of the game. That's incredibly valuable to the Orioles right now. We have seen how good the bullpen has been this year, and while it would be valuable to contending teams as well, and I certainly understand that argument, I just think he is very valuable on this team right now, and the potential trades just probably didn't match that. I think Michael Elias probably listened. I think they would have traded Jordan Lyles if the right offer was there, but I don't think that there was any offer that just met his value. But I do think the Orioles did sign him for a guaranteed $7 million in the offseason with an option for 2023 in the hopes of trading him. I think when they signed Jordan Lyles, they thought this is a guy that if he pitches well enough, by the deadline, we can sell him to a contending team. And I don't think that they miscalculated that signing because he still has a 4-2-6 ERA. He's still eating innings on a team that definitely needs it. No, no, no. But... They clearly were not able to get something for him at the trade deadline. What I will say, however, is that option for next year is a fail-safe because we saw the Orioles sign a deal with Jose Iglesias a couple years ago where they gave him a one-year deal with a team option for the following year that went up to $3.5 million. They did not trade him at the trade deadline in 2020. They held on to him. They picked up his option, and coming off a great 40-some game sample size— 
were able to flip him for some prospects to the Angels. I think that is what the Orioles are hoping to do with Jordan Lyles. If he has a great final two months of the season, or even a solid final two months of the season, his ERA gets back down to four, his whip gets under what is a massive right now, was coming into last night at 1.4. It was a little bit too high, I think, for him to be dealt, and he's never going to be a strikeout pitcher. If his numbers get a little bit better, maybe the Orioles pick up that $11 million option, and there are teams that are calling. I don't know how likely that is, And that's why Jordan Lyles was smart to negotiate for $11 million, which is a high, high number for an option for next year. But I see the thinking. And there's a path here that was laid out by the Jose Iglesias signing and then trade. And I would have understood a Jordan Lyles trade. But again, outside of the numbers I mentioned, the help that it has to a bullpen, this is also a veteran presence for all of these pitchers on a team that lost John Means. Yeah. So this is pretty much your veteran guy in the locker room right now, and I think that's valuable as well. Another thing that you can't really quantify is what these young pitchers have been able to take from having Jordan Lyles in the clubhouse with them as pretty much the only veteran pitcher right now with no John Means in there. Yeah, that rotation could change dramatically over the final couple months of the season as well as Kyle Bradish looks to continue to establish himself Hopefully, D.L. Hall pitches a little bit better in AAA Norfolk than he has been recently. Yeah, he has not looked good. Yeah. And I know that Orioles Twitter does not like that because Orioles Twitter has been clamoring for D.L. Hall lately, and they haven't been clamoring for him over the last week or so because D.L. Hall has not been good at AAA Norfolk. We know the stuff is there. We know the potential is certainly there. But the O's clearly believe that those command issues need to get under control at AAA Norfolk before they can confidently throw him every fifth day. And look, you can talk about the moves at the deadline all you want. This is still a competitive team at the major league level. The Orioles are trying to win games. Yes, they're prioritizing the rebuild, but they're trying to win games right now. And if D.L. Hall is walking too many guys and giving up too many runs... That's not somebody you want at the major league level right now. No, and you don't want to call him up while his confidence is a little bit shaky, which it could be after two rough starts with AAA. Before we get out of here, Brendan, I do want to touch on some draft notes because August 1st was the deadline to sign draft players. The Orioles signed 18 of their players that they drafted in the 2022 MLB draft, but one notable name that they did not sign was the 81st overall pick, the first pick of day two of the draft, Nolan McLean, who was the two-way player from Oklahoma State. A little bit surprising. He was the Very. highest drafted player that did not come to terms with the team that drafted him. So he's going to head back to school, and the Orioles are going to get a compensation pick right around where they they picked at number 81 overall. But a little bit disappointing, I think, that Nolan McLean does not come to terms with the O's. Yeah, absolutely. And that was an exciting prospect. I think you and I were both excited at the potential of the Orioles drafting a two, two-way player with this 81st overall pick. We talked about coming into the draft, how exciting it was that the Orioles had five picks within this top range here. And Nolan McLean was one of those picks. Five picks in the top 81. Right. Yeah. So... Again, an an exciting prospect that the Orioles aren't able to come to terms with. But again, it's not like you completely lose him. Like you said, the Orioles will get a compensation pick next year right around this range. So they can make hopefully a similar selection with a prospect of similar talent. But this was a very deep draft with a lot of talented players within the top 100. So Nolan McLean goes 81st overall in a very deep draft. I will say, though, the Orioles did make some surprising signings yeah. rather than than some surprising no signings. Uh, they did sign Carter Young. Their 17th round pick was an LSU transfer, former Vanderbilt shortstop. Most folks did not believe that the Orioles would be able to sign Young because he was in the transfer portal. Seemed like he was ready to play another year of college baseball. That's an exciting young shortstop who is much more talented than his 17th round price tag would suggest because most teams just assumed that they could not sign him. So that's why he slipped that far. So that's an exciting signing that we didn't think the Orioles would get, but certainly believed that they could have and should have gotten McLean. I think they maybe thought that they weren't going to be able to sign Carter Young when they took him and they ended up 
signing him for a reported $1.33 million. Now, the value of those picks, once you get to day three, anything that is $125,000 or less does not count against your draft pool. So you're going to see a lot of guys that get offered $125,000 or less because teams don't have a whole lot of cash to spend at that point. So them going so far over that number in order to sign Carter Young probably took them out of the conversation for McLean. So I don't think it was a one-to-one decision of do we keep Mc- do we sign McLean or do we sign Carter Young, but one had to have influenced the other because right. it all comes out of the same draft pool. So the value for the 81st overall pick was 794000 Clearly McLean wanted a little bit something more than that, and the Orioles said, boy, we just gave Carter Young 1.33. We like him a lot. I don't know if we're going to be able to give you $1 million or something more like that, McLean, and you're going to have to head back to school. Yeah, that, who knows? Maybe they draft McLean again next year, and yeah. they just try to sign him again then. Who could, knows? Could be a Judd Fabian-like situation, right? and you never know. It's always a risk for those guys. When you go that high, is your draft value going to stay the same? Is it going to dip? Like we saw Judd Fabian's at Florida dip a little bit with the extra year. The other question I have, real quick, is about whether he maybe wanted to be maybe wanted to be developed or utilized more as a hitter. When the Orioles drafted him, they made it clear this guy's a pitcher, and we can DH him a couple times if we want to, but we believe that his long-term future is as a pitcher. Maybe McLean, the numbers were matching up, but maybe he decided I would rather be viewed as a hitter. I would rather be viewed as a true two-way prospect, and the Orioles are trying to pigeonhole me. Just just guessing, just speculating here. I think that's possible, but I would also assume that that's a conversation that would have been had pre-draft, where the Orioles would have said, you know, what are you envisioning in terms of where you should be playing? And, of course, the Orioles would have the ultimate decision in where he would play. But I think if they got the indication from McLean pre-draft that he wanted to be more of a hitter, then the Orioles probably would have gone with in another direction with this pick. A lot more conversations could have been happening before that. I was talking about this with Tim Leonard, our producer, and he was saying, it's funny because McLean was the first pick of the second day. You would think that the Orioles would have had time between the end of day one and the beginning of day two to get on the phone with McLean and come to terms with some kind of contract and agree on what number they were going to give him. Otherwise, they would not have taken him with the first pick of day two. Yeah, it's surprising that the Orioles don't get McLean. But again, they have another chance next year to draft a player, hopefully of similar caliber around the same pick. So it's not like all is lost here, but certainly disappointing that the O's don't get an exciting two-way prospect here. Absolutely. Well, that just about does it for our podcast today. Brendan, at Brendan Morty is his Twitter handle. I am at Paul Mancano. Our long July into the beginning of August is uh, finally, uh, I know, feel bad for us. We, we cover baseball. and it's, I, I, I feel bad complaining. But that was a busy two, three, four-week stretch. Things will start to calm down just a little bit, and uh, we will have continued coverage for you as we get into the dog days of summer here. Yeah. Thanks to Tim Leonard for producing this podcast. Thanks to you for following along and commenting. If you are watching live, you can also catch the podcast on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcast, anywhere you get your podcast. You can get the Mass and All Access podcast, and we will catch you next time.